It is one of the loneliest islands in the world. A volcanic outcropping, it sits alone more than 2,000 miles off the coast of South America. And west of it in the Pacific, no land fall for another 1,000 miles. An island that has forgotten its history. There is only speculation to account for the weird images, some weighing 30 tons, some 20 feet tall. No one knows for sure who made them or how, or how long it is they have been staring seaward to mystify the world. It was a beautiful morning, December 13th, 1964. The first white man the natives ever saw was a Dutch sea captain, Roggeveen, on Easter Sunday, 1722. He gave the island a new name, Easter. And his men shot some of the natives to teach them a lesson. What were these invaders up to? The Canadians welcomed aboard the Chilean governor of the island. The ship, the Cape Scott of the Royal Canadian Navy. This time, the invaders were expected. The code name of the operation was Metai meaning nothing more sinister than the medical expedition to Easter Island. A missionary, Father Ricardo, welcomed the leader, Dr. Scorina. Scorina's aim was to observe the islanders in a way that has never before happened to a whole people. Scorina is a professor at McGill University. The expedition brought the makings of a complete scientific study center. It included 24 collapsible trailer units. These were so ingeniously devised that within days a whole new village had risen in a field near Hangaroa, the village of the natives. Here, 38 scientists were to live for the next two months. Most of them were Canadian, like Dr. Helen Reed, a Toronto pediatrician. But among them were people from Norway, the USA, England, Switzerland, Chile, with specialties like marine biology, virology, parasitology. they choose this island to observe? One reason is its very remoteness and isolation and the still fairly primitive simplicity of the way of life here. They grow corn as cattle feed. They raise some vegetables, but the soil is generally poor. That's why the big thing is the animal that can thrive on sparse vegetation. There are 40,000 sheep. The island has been described as a wool factory for Chile. The wool
wool is shipped off to the mainland when the supply boat calls once a year. For the islanders, once a week is mutton day. Every Monday, they call in at the station for the carcass to which each family is entitled. The diet is supplemented with bananas, pineapples, taro. They're fairly self-sufficient. They have to be, for they're away off the trade routes of the world. December 17th, a doctor from California put a mark on the wall of Pedro Patano's home. It was the beginning of a census. The first job was to make contact and find out who everybody was and where everybody was. Everybody turned out to be 949 islanders. There have been many studies made of cross-sections or samplings of populations, but this expedition was unique. Its aim was to study a total population, every man, woman and child. Mrs. Isabel Griffiths, the Spanish-speaking secretary, had 949 appointments to make with a whole series of doctors. The kids particularly could hardly wait for their turn, and the first to be examined were the stars of the show. They could tell the other kids waiting outside about all the strange things the doctors asked them to do. just a sweet drink to test how fast the sugar would be absorbed into the bloodstream. The interpreter tried to explain why they were asked to do these curious things. But few of the islanders could understand why these strangers should be so interested in them. Most of them were delighted, of course, but the whole thing did seem to be something of a joke. Dr. Scorina wrote, I have never met more friendly, honest, or intelligent people. Yet the islanders have had so terrible a history that it is surprising that any are left to study. The first white men found 4,000 islanders, but they brought white men's diseases to people without immunity. The ancestors of this infant were captured by slavers and died in servitude in the mines of Peru. Tribal wars broke out. By 1870, there were only 111 Easter Islanders left. Like the Indians of Newfoundland, the last of whom was shot down for sport, as a people, the Easter Islanders should have vanished from the face of the earth. Yet there was enough strength in them to make a miraculous comeback. The great battery of tests applied was first to determine the physical shape of the islanders. Dr. Byton was a tropical disease specialist from England. Dr. Roberts, a pediatrician from Halifax, taking hair samples to examine for fungus infection. Some must have found their examiners rather odd indeed. What were they really trying to find out about them? The answer is everything possible, including racial derivation. Where did Carlo get the color of his eyes? Is there anything in the theory that these South Sea Island people are in origin Indians from South America? Not long ago, another expedition on the famous raft Contiki 
prove that it is possible to float across the Pacific on ocean currents from South America. Did these people themselves originally come from the East? But when the hematologists went after blood, it wasn't primarily to solve racial mysteries. The islanders are unaffected by many of our diseases. The germs haven't got there yet. Isolation has been their protection. The vast ring of empty sea around them has tempted few visitors. Now there are plans to build a modern airport. Their isolation will be over. It is an urgent necessity to learn everything about them now, before that happens. On a sweltering afternoon, Fred Joyce, lab technician from Halifax, prepares blood samples. A hematologist from Switzerland, Dr. Montandon, preserves them in the lyophilizer at 10 below zero centigrade. A Norwegian, Dr. Mira, will send his samples to specialized laboratories in Panama, Oslo, Montreal, Washington, and somebody will analyze a dusty powder which a few months earlier flowed in the veins of Francisco Muki. The mystery of where the islanders came from is to be solved not by brave adventurers, but by painstaking scientific measurement. Evidence is piling up that the islanders came originally from the west, that they are basically Polynesian. They are true South Sea Islanders, not only by geography, but by race. But while the scientists measured and poked and probed, one islander said, you think you know all about us, but you know nothing of what goes on. You go around all day with your eyes closed. Events were brewing that could mean failure of the mission. Just four weeks after the Cape Scott had arrived, another invader landed another little village on Easter. Forty Marines from Chile to maintain order in a crisis. The islanders were seething with discontent. A few islanders are sent to the mainland for higher education. One of them, Alfonso Rappu, returned as a schoolteacher. Handsome, articulate, and full of ideas for the betterment of his people. Commander Rojas and staff were sent by Chile to investigate an explosive situation. Dr. Scorina had plenty to worry about. They had made all their arrangements, of course, through the Chilean governor who administered the island. What if Rapu turns the islanders against us, innocent bystanders though we are? 
There were rumors that Rapu's assistant had been shot, that Rapu himself was now in hiding. And for the moment, Commander Rojas seemed in no mood to come to terms with those who questioned the right of the Chilean Navy to administer the island, however benevolently. The islanders had grievances. They tell us we are part of Chile, but we have no voice in the government. And then, when things had reached fever pitch, Rojas decreed that a free election was to take place. Rapu and his candidates were overwhelmingly and legally swept into office. They celebrated with the best Sao Sao feast in years. Islanders have a special reason for not welcoming ships from the mainland. Once a year, they suffer a disease they call Kokongo. It breaks out every time the supply ship arrives from Chile. And true to form, the Marines carried with them something that set the Islanders coughing and shaking. Yet the Marines themselves had no symptoms. They were perfectly healthy. Dr. Armand Boudreau of the Microbiological Institute of Montreal worked far into the nights on the riddle of Kokongo. It was a good bet that the unwelcome visitor to the island was a virus lodged in the throats of the Marines. Once you've made a culture in which a virus can multiply, you can study it. They were on the trail of a medical mystery. If it is a common flu virus, why hadn't the Cape Scott brought it? Certainly it is virulent for the 10 days it takes to travel from Chile. Supposing the journey took four weeks, like the Cape Scott, would the organism they were bottling still have its power to invade the islanders? Once they found out precisely what it was, would they be able to develop a vaccine that would make it harmless? One might well ask why a veterinarian from McDonald College, a specialist in animal diseases, should be included in the expedition. Dr. Murphy was to find that the cattle were entirely free of tubercular infection, but were host to bacteria, which cause a form of dysentery common among the children on Easter. Zoonosis is a medical specialty which studies transmission of disease from animal to man. The whole island was like a laboratory in which they were trying to track down any element in the environment, however unexpected, that might throw light on the physical capacities of the islanders themselves. The one test the men found most absurd was the bicycle that didn't go anywhere, in charge of Dr. Ekblom, a Swedish physiologist. It measures the capacity for physical exertion. Though they are willing and cheerful, the islanders haven't much physical endurance. Is it constitutional, a hereditary weakness? Or is it related somehow to the environment? Has it some connection, perhaps, with diet? One of Skorina's reasons for choosing Rapa Nui, as the natives call their island, was that it is small enough 
to get to know the total environment thoroughly. The island was mapped into small squares and a soil sample taken from each so as to get the total picture. What organisms live in this earth? What plants are native to it? What is this soil best suited to grow? What insects flourish and why? Even the sea must be known, for an island's total environment includes the waters around it. everyone volunteered to help out Dr. Effort, the marine biologist, in his delightful labors. Two score experts trying to build up a picture of a total environment. They gathered thousands of specimens, thousands of facts, and the job of correlating was so involved it could only be handled by computers. However fine the net of environmental science, it can catch only one kind of secret. In the people themselves lay another kind of secret. What was in their minds and hearts? The interpreters were busy providing a bridge between islanders and sociologists. Why did many of them say they wanted to leave the island and go to Chile or Tahiti? After a while, the investigators were astonished to find many claiming they would like to move to Canada, though they had never heard of it before the expedition came. They called their island Rapa Nui, which means navel of the world. Yet the young generation feels that their future lies elsewhere. The islanders became very fond of the strangers in their midst who provided them with medical attention and mended their injuries. During the expedition's stay, the population of Easter increased by three. Mariana Perez's baby was to be christened. She chose as godparents Isabel Griffith and Dr. Cutler, an epidemiologist from California. The following Sunday, they gave Dr. Scarina a feather headdress, for he had been chosen as godfather for the second new arrival, christened Elena. The newborn ones will be perhaps three years old before science comes back to the island in force to continue its study of a whole people. Their present mission was almost completed. The record had only one gap left. few, like Antonio Muque, had been reluctant to be examined, but the day came when he was congratulated as the last one. February 15th, and time to say goodbye for now. At the farewell, the chief spokesman on behalf of the islanders was Rappel, dedicated to progress, or at least to change. 
The day is coming when the lonely island will be overrun by tourists. A modern airport is due. The islanders will no longer be isolated. And as their environment changes, it will be possible to measure scientifically how it affects the life of the people. on the island, Father Sebastian has seen few changes. When Scorina comes back, he will see many changes. once circulated wild and strange stories in connection with the images. The images were thrown down, reads one fanciful account, after the warrior trapped 30 of the enemy in a cave and ate them in revenge. Myth, legend, speculation about Easter Island have given way before the probing eye of science, whose findings may be less melodramatic, but in the end, more useful to mankind.